what's it like to build a startup from the ground up? Hi, welcome to episode 16 of Backs of All Trades podcast. Today, I'm with Nader Khalil. He's actually the CEO and co-founder of Brev, my new company where I work at. I actually was thinking about having Nader on before I was going to join Brev once I started the podcast. And now we're sitting here in the brickyard in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I started my first week at Brev the company. Nader, thank you so much for coming on. I'm excited to talk. Yeah, I'm stoked to chat and really excited to be working on a team with you. Yeah. So uh, the first question that I ask people when I have them on is just sort of their, you know, elevator pitch. Like, who are you? Yeah. Um, so name is Nader, uh, co-founder and CEO of Brev. Brev is a really easy way to use GPUs. We kind of been jokingly saying easy to use GPUs. Um, and uh, yeah, I am uh, someone who's just really excited about uh, getting the opportunity to build stuff. And uh, my first startup was building stuff. And it makes sense then that my second startup is making it easier to build stuff. Uh, but yeah, I think just uh, always looking for challenging problems to solve and doing it with great people. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, you, you and I go way, way <laughs> back, actually, um, like even more than decades. And I think the story of not only like how we met, but how you ended up getting into engineering is a really interesting one. So I want to, you, you tell the story great. I was honestly too young, but I want to hear uh, how we actually met. <laughs> yeah. So um, in 2007, I was in seventh grade and uh, I got my first compute, my first laptop. And it was one of those old like plastic white MacBooks and it had a webcam and it was the first time that I had a camera. So um, I started making these Learn Arabic videos. Uh, my family's Lebanese, uh, immigrant parents. I was born in San Diego. And so I make these Learn Arabic videos. And this is like 2007, pre-Google YouTube. I found out about YouTube from uh, summer camp. Someone told me I could like search for songs and listen to them. Uh, and the, you, the videos actually did decently well. Uh, they got like 70,000 views. And this guy recognizes me at a Starbucks, uh, at a local Starbucks. And he's like, hey, do you teach Arabic on YouTube? And I'm like, holy shit, this is the best day of my life. And uh, he asked if I would teach his kids in person. Turns out he was also Lebanese, but his wife's American and his kids didn't pick up the language. And so this is the best day of my life. Of course, I am down to teach his kids Arabic in person. So, uh, and my parents were excited too, because we're at the time living in Albuquerque, New Mexico. My mom's a nuclear engineer and Albuquerque is like the Silicon Valley for nuclear. <laughs> um, and so, uh, uh, that guy brings you and your twin brother over and uh, I teach you guys Arabic. And uh, my parents were thrilled because they got to drink Arabic coffee with your dad, uh, which there are not a lot of Lebanese people in Albuquerque. And uh, after the session, your dad was really excited because you guys were like chunking out words and actually reading Arabic. So he tried to pay, but my parents wouldn't let him pay. One, because the Lebanese to Lebanese thing. Two, they were just like, hey, we immigrated to this country so that Nader would focus on his education. Turns out your dad was the head of the electrical and computer engineering department. I'm from San Diego living in Albuquerque. My dream was to be a marine biologist. I just wanted to move back to like the ocean. And your dad says, hey, well, as a way to repay, let me know when you start high school, I can give you a tour of some labs and see if we can get you an internship. So I toured the robotics labs and fell in love. I felt like you, uh, you'd write a line of code in the computer and then like a physical thing moves. And I think at a very early age, it unlocks this idea that you can write code to solve real, like real world problems. And, um, so that's how we met, uh, way back in 2007. And, uh, it's because of your dad that I got into engineering. And actually when we were just starting our first startup, uh, and getting into YC, your dad made a small angel investment, which was huge. And it kind of just came full circle. Yeah, no, I talk a lot about on my platform about connections and how, you know, uh, I call them quantum leap level interactions. And you don't know whether, like whether an interaction is going to be a quantum leap level interaction, but you know, you deciding to make the Arabic video <laughs> and then also saying yes to like, yes, I'll tutor these kids. You know, even if you weren't so passionate about it, just saying yes in that moment, you didn't know who my dad was, whether he would be able to help you in the future. And then, you know, all of that coming full circle to now, you know, me working for you uh, and with you is, is just crazy. And that's like a testament to maintaining like relationships and, you know, doing stuff, just kind of not knowing where they'll go, but because good things happen to good people. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think it's, um, uh, everything is luck. Like all success is luck, but the, but you can gamify luck. The harder you work, the luckier you get. If you think of it like lottery tickets, well, the way that you hack the lottery is by make getting a bunch of tickets. So broaden your, your, um, window of opportunity, your like surface area for luck to happen to you. And so just kind of like choosing things that you're excited about and just going all in. I think, I think, um, like, Honestly, I think everything dies when you start to think about opportunity costs and things like that. Like, oh, well, I could be doing this versus this. Just like 
be very intentional as opposed to focusing on optionality. Find things that you like, dive all in on them, and then something amazing is gonna happen. Like even for you, right? Like quitting quitting your job and where you were making more than what we can afford to pay now, right? Um, it's very easy to think, well, okay, let me optimize. Let me think of optionality. Let me think about like all the different ways and startups I can go. But instead you just kind of leaned in. And I think because of that, uh, more things will, like, yeah, more good will happen. It's, uh, yeah. yeah. No, that's great. So the, the, the company that, you started and and now we're we're both currently working is called Brev and you briefly explained it. Um, I want you to dive a little bit more into uh, what it is, how the idea came about, and um, maybe even like what it transformed from to like about finding uh, an actual problem that's worth you know diving and solving basically. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's funny. I think as also as entrepreneurs, as founders, and you know, I think just part of the growth is just. Um, feeling very stupid every three months for the way that you operated three months prior. And that just shows, I think, how much you're learning and growing, um, both as a business, as an individual and all of that. But yeah, Brev at a high level, we just want to make it the easiest way for you to train and fine tune AI models. I think it's inevitable that the future is going to be one where um, every application has AI. I had a buddy ask, should I buy this really smart .ai domain? I said, no, because like you wouldn't buy a .database domain, right? <laughs> like it's just, it's just gonna be baked into every application. And so if you think about where the world the world's heading, um, um, as uh, you know, if the government wants to sub wants folder files or folders in your desk, they have to present you with a warrant. They go into your house. You're aware that this happened, and then they get access to your data. Um, but what happens today is they actually just give a subpoena to like Google or you know Dropbox. They take your data, and those companies are actually as part of the subpoena. They're they're not allowed to tell you that this happened. So your your data has very much got, been gone through. And you have no no idea that this that this happened. And so, as we think about now AI, where it's way more valuable than just your data, it's you know, let's say you have a, a model that's trained on your journal entries, right? That you can you can prompt it situations, and it can it can figure out uh, what you would do, right? Um, that seems like a scary thing for a company or corporation or a government to have access to without, especially without your knowledge. And so. Um, what I think is almost like a moral imperative that we have to do is to make it really easy for people to train these own your own model. You should always be in control of your data, of your model, um, and it shouldn't be a thing that's hard to do. It should be a better experience for you to have control of this. And if you do have control of your own model, if you are able to iterate and give models access to your data, and you owned it the whole time, uh, it would, you're, you're always going to be, you, you'll feel more comfortable giving it more data. And, uh, and I think and these models do perform better when they have access to relevant data. So the the ideal would be that you could give it your entire phone and Mac, have something that's really, really valuable to you, but um, not something that you're worrying as a liability. Yeah, um, no, that's great. Um, And this is not what Brev was, you know, a year ago or even two years ago. And so uh, how did that transformation take place? Yeah. So um, the, the intention when we started Brev, we were building an ad tech startup earlier and um, after that, it kind of felt like every time we were scaling, we were just dealing with a lot of infrastructure issues, it, um, which is the worst because we have a bunch of stakeholders. They all want stuff, right? And we want to build all that stuff, but our bandwidth is entirely going to just maintaining the, uh, the systems. It kind of feels like what the work this month is here at Brev, right? Where we've, we've been experiencing a lot of scale and now we just have to like fix all the systems, but there's all these features we want to build and we just can't. And so that ended up... Uh, it just felt like a terrible rite of passage <laughs> of having something that's starting to succeed. Um, so we built Brev initially to just make it really easy to use cloud infrastructure. And we approached the problem very naively at first. Um, we were just kind of hacking around at a few solutions. We ended up finding ourselves building cloud dev environments, which is the idea that you do all of your coding in the cloud. And um, we were running with that, but we felt that, they, that cloud dev environments didn't have PMF. And I feel very strongly now that they don't, um, which is a story for another time. But... Um, while we were building cloud dev environments, we had AI developers ask us, and this is before the AI hype cycle and excitement started, we had these AI developers ask us, can you support GPUs? We didn't really know about GPUs, uh, and we thought, sure, let's do it. And um, when we did that, we realized we were solving a big problem for them. For a lot of AI developers, they're focusing on the AI code. They're not coming from infrastructure backgrounds. And for us having infrastructure expertise, you know, um, I was building cloud dev environments actually at Workday. Alec was doing VM optimizations at Azure. Like we come from infrastructure, from strong infrastructure backgrounds. That actually proves itself really valuable in the AI space as a tool. And so um, that once we, once we kind of saw and felt like, oh, we're actually solving a really big problem for these users. We just leaned all in and yeah. Yeah, no, it's great. I, I joined at a, a really fun time because I think that, yeah, things are, a lot of the 
Uh, and there will be more nebulous times in the future, but at, at least a lot of the big, big ones seems to be more or less um, figured out. There is a vision yeah. um, that we're working towards, and it'll probably <laughs> pivot again at some point in some fashion. Um, but y- the hard work uh, y- you've already gone through. And um, what's interesting is that you you briefly mentioned um, uh, your former ad tech company. Um, and uh, for a lot of people, uh, naively, I think when they think about like getting into entrepreneurship or startup, they get so married to not only their first idea, but their first company that um, if that were to go south, uh, I think most people would probably be like, oh, maybe it's not for me. And so I want to hear about the sort of story of, hey, this maybe didn't work out and um, how you move on from that and say, no, like I actually want to go build again. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I was... Uh I mean, so my mom was a uh, big inspiration for our family. My uh, my mom uh, did her PhD and she was in school until I was nine. So I actually grew up on UC San Diego's campus where I would just kind of like wander to the bookstore and like eat some Funyuns and whatnot. And so my siblings uh, both uh, have PhDs, I think following my mom's footsteps. I also was applying to PhD programs and I was working in this research lab and Workday, my senior year of college, comes and recruits me on campus. They flew me to the Bay. I get sent back to SFO in like what was like a limo with like champagne bottle. And I was just, I get back to UCSB and I think like, man, uh, they, uh, like my professor would never, <laughs> the research I was doing. So I ended up just like not doing the PhD, even I had just applied and I just went into industry. And the second that happened, I started getting these like anxiety attacks because I think my idea of what I wanted from the world completely shattered, right? And now I'm just like in SF, with no sense of plan or anything. And while I'm at Workday with these anxiety attacks, um, Workday has their own programming language. And so I built a dev tool for, I just I had an idea that would make the programming language better. And so I just built it and released it to some folks at the company. And I have no idea about entrepreneurship. I don't know what Y Combinator is. And uh, it was really well received. The senior VP emails it to every developer at the company and says like, hey, go download Natter School. And that felt really good. And then it was just like, oh wait, we can just, do this, but on the larger stage, like it could, it could be to more than just workday developers. Um, and so then uh, I'm working with Alec on just some other projects and I was getting a beer with a bar owner and he's venting that he has a thousand clicks on his Google ads, but no one's in this bar other than me and Alec. And so we realize digital ads make a lot of sense for digital businesses. If you click on an Amazon banner ad, you've entered Amazon storefront and you can make a purchase. But if you're, if you click on a, on an ad for like a a local bar, what value did that drive them? Like nothing. So we thought, how do we build a digital ad that brings physical value to a physical business? And, um, it was like really late one night, Alec finds this hack in the Uber app where we could change your Uber's destination. <laughs> so we made these ads that would, we, we essentially bought a bunch of tablets from China and uh, it was like DHgate was the website. They come, they're super cheap tablets and we mounted them in, in Ubers and Lyfts. Uh, and this is in 2018. And uh, if you tapped on the ad, we would reroute your Uber to go to that <laughs> bar. And so you're going out with friends for drinks. You see buy one, get one free margaritas. You tap the screen, we'll take you there. The driver gets a tip. The bar owner knows his ad worked. You get a free drink, everyone wins. Um, and so we completely bootstrapped. I quit my job, bef- like, or I quit my job actually before, like essentially almost like the same day the tablets came in. Um, and we just com- we just bootstrapped it. And um, and then, you know, your, your dad, we had to raise like a small, like friends and family round. Your dad was part of that. And then, um, uh, we got into Y Combinator and, you know, that was great. We got to like a quarter mil revenue and the week of our demo day, we were the winner 20 batch for Y Combinator, which is right when the pandemic was happening. We were in San Francisco, which is where the shelter in place was like the strictest and also the first. Um, and so the week of our demo day, our fleet of 400 cars went to seven. And ev- like literally like, we're going to pitch to investors and it's just all collapsing. And so, um, uh, yeah, it was a it was a wild ride. I think as a as a founder, you kind of often have this feeling of like, oh, what would I do when I fail? And um, I guess it's nice to have that answered. Like, oh yeah, you're just gonna kind of do it again. And I think it pays off to just be very lighthearted about things. Like, um, give everything your all, um, and it ends up you end up having more energy to keep going if you do. Yeah, no, that that's insane. I think that um, there's probably that's one of many sort of crazy uh, startup stories that you have, and I, I I know of a couple other ones. Um, even here at the Brickyard, I've I've talked about this story before uh, of the burn the ships, right? Um, and essentially meaning like give yourself no 
way out. And uh, you did that a couple times. And so uh, like running out of money and stuff like that. So I want to hear uh, what your sort of scrappiest uh, startup moment <laughs> is. Yeah. Um, there were, there were a few. I, uh, so we, you know, we bootstrapped this, right? So we didn't have cash. We were just like barely covering rent and trying to get to revenue. As really as quickly. Possible. Cause there are people who aren't as technical, uh, bootstrapping uh, for a company, what does that mean? It just means you didn't raise venture, you don't have VCs, you don't have venture capital like investments. You, you're not, you don't have a million dollars in the bank to kind of get you through it. You, um, whatever money you poured in is what is what's there and you gotta find a source of revenue very quickly. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, like uh, we needed tablets and these tablets were expensive coming from, uh, coming from, uh, China and also they didn't have data. They didn't have SIM cards or anything. And so what we actually, for the first hundred drivers, we made them hotspot from their phones. And that was that was a mess. Like if they went and filled up gas, the hotspot disconnects. And then we don't have metrics because the hotspot disconnected. So then they're like, hey, I drove this tablet all around. And it was probably just sitting there with like whatever cached ads were sitting, you know, but we didn't have metrics. We didn't pay them. They'd get mad. It was just a mess. And so we needed <laughs> we needed to get SIM cards. So I called AT&T and I asked them for their best quote on some tablets. Um, and then I called Verizon and then they beat AT&T. And then I called Sprint, which beat Verizon. And then I called T-Mobile, which beat Sprint. And then I went back to AT&T and they're like, fuck it, free tablets, just pay the data. So it was like 10 bucks a month um, per tablet. And then they all kind of matched that. So we would just go to whoever wanted to give us cheaper stuff. Um, and uh, so yeah, we we um, we actually ran out of money in July, June, July, I forget, uh, in 2019. And uh, I remember we were running, you know, we're just, just barely running. Uh, and this was a big lesson learned that customers don't pay their invoices on time. <laughs> you have to like really chase people to get their invoices paid on time. And actually there's a whole industry of just people will like go and do the chasing for you if they can get 20% of the invoice or whatever. But, um, you know, I look at our Excel sheet and it looks like we have 20 K in the bank, but, um, I wake up on this Saturday and it's negative 200 and we're just like, wait, wait, why was the Excel sheet wrong? And so, yeah, um, we looked into it and there was about 19 K and missing invoices. And so we're obviously going to go chase all them down, but also like, we're negative now. And so I call Fidelity. I had a 401k from Workday and I call Fidelity uh, and I'm just like, drain it. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy's like telling me, he's like, you know, this is not a good retirement decision. I'm like, Re retirement? Like, I am thinking like like 72 hours into the future. Like we're going to go chase some invoices and I have to cover that period. And so, yeah, I, uh, we dumped the 401k. It bought us time. We got the invoices chased. And then like three months later, we got into YC. And that was, you know, that was 150k check, which was like more money than we had ever seen. And so this was, uh, yeah, so that was amazing. But um, yeah, I still don't have a 401k. So we're still, <laughs> um, so the the ship is still burnt. Uh, but <laughs> Yeah, no, that's, it's, it's, crazy to hear the the lengths that um you know sometimes it is necessary in in this industry i think that um and i think most uh companies even the the multi billion dollar ones if you go back to like the early 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 days um have have similar stories and uh you know there is some truth to be putting it all the line i i recently did an interview with um chris klaus and um he i asked him basically uh what what are the recipe for a good startup. And he said that a lot of people will come to him and ask him for funding while they're still working a nine to five job. Mm -hmm. And, um, th there's a very frank conversation, which is like, if you aren't confident enough that this will work to quit your job, nor give it your full attention, why would I give you money to go yeah, do that? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I think that, that there is some, you know, you have to almost believe in it uh, as much as you believe in yourself. Otherwise, like, why are you doing it? Yeah, and it's it, there's even like um you don't you don't have to have an answer. Like, I I'm not confident that like the exact approach we're taking is gonna work. I'm confident that we're gonna find it, and you only find it like opportunity only gives itself to someone in motion. So it's by having a solution, by presenting it, by having users that are frustrated with your shitty product that you're gonna find out what actually is shitty, and you're gonna actually just find that's again like stumbling upon luck, right? Like we didn't know that building, making it really easy to use GPUs was a good idea, but we wouldn't have uh, been offered the opportunity if we weren't already building cloud dev environments. I was talking, uh, I pitched actually to Nat Friedman, who is the ex-CEO of GitHub, and he had a funny thing where um, he mentioned that, you know, the serverless GPU space, which it, serverless is the concept that if your GPU is sitting idle, it deallocates it so you don't have to pay, but then the consequence of that is um, when you do need it again, you end up having to wait like five minutes for it to spin back up. And 
Um, I think they've fun- like he's funded a few serverless GPU companies, and he mentioned he's like, oh, your approach is very interesting. You're not taking, you're not doing serverless. And, you know, you would have had you only got to be able to think about the problem this way because you were building cloud dev environments. This makes sense. This is really cool. And so, um, you know, just an interesting like kind of anecdote from someone who's looking at a very bird's eye view of the space. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I want to pivot a little bit because uh, I, I mentioned uh, my conversation with uh, Chris Klaus. And one of the questions that I asked him as well was, uh, are there any kind of personality types or qualities in a founder that he would think are conducive to success. And, uh, I think that you have a lot of those, but I want to hear from your own words, um, what you think has been helpful thus far, as far as what the, the sort of perspectives and literally the attitudes you've taken to, for example, go out and raise money and sell an idea to somebody. Um, and then also handling users and handling, uh, when situations get bad, um, what do you think is like required from, uh, I'll, I'll say CEO, but uh, also founder at, at this stage to, to get from zero to one? Yeah, I think, uh, and I think a lot of these traits also apply to like really successful like founding teams you know our, our founding team has has varied a little bit you know you bring a lot of very unique traits that i think are also very similar to things like alec and harper and i and uh i think that's very important for a successful founding team i think the big one is like just not getting thrown off like it is a dumpster fire it is a dumpster fire it is hilarious how much of a dumpster fire it is everything is wrong is like breaking all the time and so what you really need to do is um identify the like most important part of the fire that's going to be the most catastrophic and just focus on that and actually like having problems is good i remember when we uh when we really pivoted into the gpu space uh uh harper made a comment that was like uh oh my god these users are having a bad time in the in the discord and alec replied holy shit these users are having a bad like users are using us and so they, they are having a bad time and so it is it is good to find yourself solving problems and i think flipping it because the 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 real world, the traditional world, I guess, um, you're almost like, it's like bad to have problems, right? But that's actually the only way that you learn. Um, when things go well, you don't know why they went well. If you go on a date and you like lean in for a kiss and it works, you, you know, you're going to be like, it was the lucky shirt, you know, like maybe it was my deodorant smelling good. Like you don't know what happened. Um, but, you, and you, but you'll find a reason and you'll grasp at straws and you'll pretend that it's the reason and you'll chase it. But if you lean in and like, she's just like, oh, your breath smells. Well, then like, you know exactly what, what went wrong. And so you're almost like, especially at this early stage to go from zero to one, you're searching for the failure. And if you flip that, like your goal isn't to get a yes, your goal is to get a hundred no's. That's going to be way more insightful. And so suddenly the no's are a good thing. And so I think like being uh, the, the number one trait is just like not taking things personally. Because um, if you build a feature and it's a shitty feature, and then because it's so personal, you feel like you're deleting yourself when you're deleting the feature, then like you're just you're just causing yourself so much more friction. And I think the the number one thing that probably kills like early teams and startups is just um, a lot of the infighting and that all that usually comes from people taking ideas personally. If you're deliberating an idea, just because you presented the idea doesn't mean it's a good one. So, you know, make sure that you're looking at things kind of holistically and in a very like intellectually honest way. And you can do that if you're, uh, if you're not being personal about stuff. No, I think that's great advice. Uh, what about the sort of networking slash personality side of things when it comes to um, connecting with other people in the space who who may be helping you, whether that's an investor, whether that's another uh, company or whether that's talking to customers. Uh, I, you use the phrase, which I really like a lot. You said it's, it's my job to be everybody's Habibi. <laughs> and like Habibi in uh, Arabic is just like, love, dear, uh, really good friend. Someone you really care about is a Habibi. And um, that's something that you're phenomenal at. But I think that uh, a lot of people will it's, it's not even necessarily narcissism, but, um, have the, what can they do for me, um, sort of attitude. And I think that can be detrimental. Um, and so, yeah, you, you yeah. know, actually, uh, a lot of times the world is very zero sum. You think of work life balance, meaning if I go to work for eight hours, I have eight hours less to do other stuff. But when, what, I think like the goal in life is to always find when one plus one equals three. And that happens when you are playing very positive sum games where if you pour yourself into work, whether it's building the dev tool in my own hours at work day, whether it's this, right? If you pour yourself into what you're doing, um, 
you you have more to give to other things like i think people a lot, a lot of times like especially in the early stage people say like oh you can't date there's no time to date like no i'm in a very fulfilling relationship i love my fiance we've been we've been together for eight pushing on nine years this year and i feel like when i pour myself into her i have more energy to give to brev and vice versa and she's along for the ride like i remember very fondly it was like august 2022 when we we're realizing we're going to pivot to gpus and I, I'm like showing her messages from our, from the users that hinted us in this direction. I'm explaining to her, like even I validated the idea by talking to AI startups at YC, which again, this is before the AI hype cycle. So that was actually not like a very noisy <laughs> filter. You're, if you were an AI company in 2022, you were probably like really doing like training a lot of your own stuff. So I validated the GPU problems before we went into the space and built it. And I showed her some of the email responses and she was really excited about it. And like, it's, it's, um, the idea idea that like you know i remember um uh i was i used to think in college like oh like you know i was studied computer engineering which i know you did too and it's like oh like if you're on a date with a girl like you don't want to talk too much about engineering it's kind of nerdy and so it's, it's kind of like no if you can blow that idea away and say hey i'm just gonna i'm like sharing literally e emails <laughs> with my fiance and she's excited about it right it's it's um let find find when everything can be everything and i think yeah yeah, you, you've mentioned blowing up work life balance. And I think that's great because I, I talked about that um, as part of the reason why, you know, I did quit my previous job and I actually did enjoy my job, but it was work. Um, you know, my social media thing was separate from that. My social life was separate from that. And I think if you can, um, what I really like that you and I talked about recently is um, burnout and the concept of burnout. And uh, I think a lot of people think that if they, do something for an extended period of time, that's what causes burnout. And what you said, which I really liked, is that burnout only happens when what you're, the work you're doing is taking away energy rather than giving it to you or is not fulfilling, right? If you're doing fulfilling work, you can work as long as you want without burning out because it's not depleting that sort of like, uh, you know, life force. Yeah. And even like, uh, the work itself doesn't have to be fulfilling if the mission is right. There's a lot of times when we're doing stuff that just fucking sucks <laughs> like, and you still just have to do it. You have to get through that. But, um, if you're, uh, um, if, if you're, if you feel like it's at least the, that the work isn't going unnoticed. If you feel like the work is pushing towards something, then it's really hard to burn out. And even if you're starting to feel those symptoms, just kind of look at like, you probably just need to be refilled in some way. Maybe you need like some to be refilled spiritually or maybe like literally just food and water. Maybe you just need more sleep and that's fine. Just kind of like allow for the ebbs and flows. You're gonna have weeks where you're 10X more productive than other weeks. You're gonna have weeks where you're a 10th of the productivity and like just kind of be patient with yourself. Yeah, and patient with others. Uh, uh, something that I liked in your message to all of the team uh, at the beginning of the year is you said, that um, we'll all take turns being heroes and, you know, there will be a week where you're more productive than everyone else combined. And that's not like a, God, everyone else pick it up. It's like, you know, take turns uh, sort of being the hero. And um, I think that that was something that I, honestly, a perspective that I hadn't considered before. Yeah. It, I, I think uh, you find it happens a lot because the team, you you think of probably like a, like a, um, a good team is one where you have complementary, not just skills, but blind spots, right? Like you and I have very different blind spots. You're going to see things that I don't. And that when you present them to me, I'm not going to believe you. Like I'm not going to see them, right? That's the, like, that's my blind spot. And so, um, I'll, it, you just kind of like see it happen more and more where like someone's genius shines because of the different situation and scenario. And so kind of just being very grateful for that, for that, for that member on the team. And it goes also back to the zero sum idea of just like being everyone's happy being just kind of really putting a lot of good energy out there, just like without thinking, how can you help? Because when you start to think like, Oh, how do I get this favor repaid? That's all just like wasted energy, right? That doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't take anyone anywhere. So if all the energy of you thinking how you can get repaid could instead just be spent like helping folks, like everyone can win. And that, and the same thing goes for the team. If the, the energy of like, uh, why is this person not putting in the same effort as me? Like that's all wasted energy that if could be applied towards the goal is better. And so, um, it, it's really, it's a really great feeling when you, when you feel like the team is moving without you being at the helm. And then when you find that the team is moving because you're at the helm, you're almost just like, fuck yeah, I got to pay it back. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Uh, I want to pivot a little bit. Cause, um, <laughs> I don't know if it's just the Lebanese in us, but, um, we're very opinionated people and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully there is still a chance for humility there. But, um, I want to ask you, it's the same question, but one relating to like startups and tech space and entrepreneurship. And then one about life, which is what is a belief that you hold that you think most people would disagree with? Like, what's your hot take? And this is a question I borrowed from my friend, Lucas Pactor. Um, he asks this on his podcast and I really liked it. Hmm. 
I should have think of that. Uh, what is my hot take? I feel like there's a lot. Um, I think, hmm, I'm wondering if I want if I want to say this. Um, I get, uh, I feel like optionality is, is an insecurity. Um, just like there is no such thing as, uh, opportunity cost. And if you just, if you just lean in and give your full self to something, um, it'll, it'll come back. And now I'm saying that out loud. That kind of feels like a lame hot take. <laughs> Uh, how about for your tech one? You had you had one on uh, PMF and um, people who oh, are just yeah. hunting PMF. <laughs> it's also okay. This is a hot take. I think PMF like people. I think over engineer it. Um, they're they're PMF, oh, sorry. PMF yeah. is product market fit and is essentially you can explain yeah. it. But it just means that your product is wanted by the market. That there's a fit in the market for the product that you're building. And um, you you hear this term be used almost in like a shrine sort of way. Like everyone's searching for this PMF. There's companies with millions of dollars, and you'll hear the founder say like, "We still don't have." PMF. PMF. Even Cam, the partner here at Brickyard, says it was six years into their startup that they found PMF. Um, I uh, I think people overthink PMF. I think it's and like I don't <laughs> I don't think we have PMF. Um, we, we definitely don't. We just we have early signs which are which we're which we're definitely sprinting towards. But um, I think PMF is just like a like a mediocre enough solution that kind of that kind of works that people just want to use. And I think um, there's a book called On Trails. It's literally about like how trails are made and they don't, they're not paved. They kind of emerge. And I think the, the best PMF is just putting pavement on trails that have emerged. And so look for behavior that people are kind of just like walking through the grass to do. And then just say like, okay, this is probably where we should pave it. You've probably all seen like, uh, some sort of like, uh, like architecture design where they're like, they have like a nice little 90 degree cement and people just kind of walk the grass in between. Right. So trails emerge, even if there's a paved path. And I think a lot of times what like startups are doing with PMF is they're pa they're right. They're putting pavement down and then they're wondering why no one's walking on their pavement. But if you just flip it and say, Hey, where, where are people walking? And then just go put, put pavement under their feet. Um, that's a much better way to go about it. Yeah. And then I don't know if you have one about like life in general, whether it's, you know. Uh, okay. I, I have one. This one will be, a, I think, spicier for the SF folks. Yeah. But um, I don't believe in in poly. Like people are, uh, ah. people are like poly, which is where they say like they, they like to have multiple relationships. Like in college, we call that having a hoe phase. Like you're just <laughs> single. Like, <laughs> and that's fine. You don't have to make it your identity. Um, the problem with making it your identity is then you find someone who's the one, but you're like, oh, I like them so much that I want to be to just in a relationship with them, but I can't cause I'm poly like identities can really just hold you back. And so, um, uh, yeah, just like enjoy being single if you're single and, and enjoy being in a relationship if you're in a relationship. That's a good one. I like that. Um, a lot of my audience is around the 16 to 24 year old, um, usually like tech oriented, uh, type people. And those are people who are either about to go to college or maybe in college or maybe about to start their first job. And, um, we both, I mean, went the route. I also thought by the way that I was going to go to a PhD. I was like ad admitted to a master's program and left to go do industry. Funny instead. story on this. I remember yeah. it was like the first time that we re like, we got back together since oh, yeah. Albuquerque and I saw your dad and your dad grabs you by the neck and goes, Hey, he's in a master's program. Don't convince him otherwise. And then I went and met up with you guys. And the first thing I said was like, get out of that master's program. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it sorry, was a, show it. <laughs> it was it was a it was an opinion contributing to another a number of opinions, but um, yeah. yeah, but um, I think a lot of people at that age do have sort of like an identity crisis, and maybe are following the the masses. And um, yeah, one of the most common questions I get is like, how do I get an internship at Fang? How do yeah. I become a quant? And uh, I'm wondering if you have any advice to those people, um, and maybe they do want to go towards that. But if you were to be able to talk to yourself like freshman or sophomore year of college, what would you uh, tell them? Yeah, I think the first one is like, just don't get thrown off. Like, I, I think the thing that, you know, what, what contributed to like me having like anxiety attacks about this and stuff was just, I, I felt like, um, I remember I got this comment that was like, oh, like I graduated. Congratulations. It's the first day of your rest of your life. And like, that's like a really poor framing because it makes it seem like you're choosing which train to get on and you're never allowed to get off of it. And that's not the case. Every like every experience is going to contribute to your other experiences. I am so grateful that my first startup didn't work out. This is now now Alec and my third swing, right? We did the first startup. It didn't pan out. We did the second one and had a really quick acquisition and now we're building Brev. And so you... Um, yeah, like be grateful for every experience. And so there's, there's no wrong answer. I think that's the, that's the best thing. Like, I think a lot of times in college, like I remember when I was in college, um, 
People were just comparing how much money they were making. And it's funny because a lot of times it's easier to compare something that's tact that's tangible than something that's intangible. And so the tangible is how much money you're going to make in a year. The intangible is whether that's actually going to lead into anything. I think I remember when I was in college, there was this, uh, they, they compared like UC Berkeley had the highest starting salary uh, for engineering, but UC Santa Barbara had the highest mid-career salary. And why is that? Probably because you're a little more social at UC Santa Barbara. So you'll, you'll, you know, yeah, it's it's not just about what your your starting salary, and so just don't don't play those games that are like trying to optimize that. Like a lot of people want to go into quant because it's going to make a lot of money, but cool, you're probably going to be extremely unfulfilled, and you're going to lose the earliest part, of, like the most essential parts of your career in your early twenties when you just have no clue what you want from the world, and you're like you're just like reading books, and you're you're at work, and you're like I don't like this kind of work. Like you need those moments, and so kind of just like uh, chase. I guess just chase things that you think you'll actually like because you actually like them. Um, and so the internship at Fang doesn't matter. I think uh, try to try to get try to just go as close to the metal as possible. Like at an internship at Fang, you're gonna have so much structure around you. That's actually probably not what you want. We had an intern last summer. We don't typically have interns at Brev just because it takes a lot of um, it takes a lot of. Uh, it just takes a lot of energy from us to invest in the internship properly. Um, and, uh, I, and then also like, I don't know how much to pay for that. Like that's just, just, there's so many questions that it just takes a lot of resources from the company and you're not really sure how much you're getting back. But this kid just kept texting me and texting me and texting me. And then he, I was just like, look, if you just want to come and work next to us, you can like, we can like breathe the same air and see what happens. But like, we don't have time for an internship. And so he did, he just showed up unpaid, just, just trying to get something out of this. Right. And then I was like, you know what? Fine. I'll give you a few small tasks. I gave him some small engineering tasks and he finished them way faster than I expected. So then I gave him more tasks and more tasks. And then he starts coming to scrum and in scrum, we're like talking about what we're doing today. And there's like this task we had and we're like, who's taking it? And he just raises, he's like, could I take it? And we're just like, yeah, you want to take it? And so now, uh, I mean, I offered him if he wanted to do a paid internship continued through the year, and I'm hoping he reaches out if he wants to if he wants to work here uh, once he graduates this year. But um, that's what I think you should do as an internship is like kind of like go off the beaten path. Everyone's breaking their, you know, their necks for these for these fang uh internships you're not going to benefit as much from them it's going to sound cool but um this kid learned so much that i would literally i actually offered him to drop out and just join us because that's how much he, he learned in that three month cycle and so three months in he leaves having as much skill as a professional software engineer but he's still in college versus if he was at fang he would have had a fun spinny hat and made more money but like what was worth it what was more worth it yeah no i think that's all so in line with my, my opinions on uh, the field. I think that um, beyond just the money, I think that there is like, like I said, an identity issue and it's, you know, I'm studying software engineering. I will be the coolest version of me if I go to a, a fan company. Uh, that means I, I won, I succeeded, whether it is for the salary or whether it is for literally the title alone. Um, and uh, it, when it comes to like, for example, we were having uh, lunch with the, the VCs here and uh, people who have, you know, exited, super like th these people could retire and sit on their bum all day for the rest of their life. And, um, this is true for a lot of people who exit really successful companies. They look for the next thing. Some will start companies again. You know, they could be billionaires, they exit and they go, I want to start again from zero. Right. And obviously they have a lot more knowledge, but it's because that dollar value is not what actually fulfills you. And a lot of people actually will, get into like a post depression or like a depression when they exit. And it's like, okay, now I'm a billionaire, but the thing that I was so passionate about and building for so many years is now gone for my life. There's literally, you could not put a dollar value on waking up every day with fervor to just go and apply yourself. And, um, you know, there's even with my fiance, we were talking cause she's in medical school. So she's also pouring her, her hours in and we used to, you know, and we're in a long distance relationship since she's in medical school and we live in San Francisco. And, um, uh, we used to just call each other at the end of the day and it was just kind of like a very downer of a call because we're both just so exhausted from, from pouring ourselves in all day. And so I was like, how are you doing? Tired, tired. And so we actually made a rule. We're no longer going to say tired. We're going to say applied. Every day you get you get your pockets filled with hours and you lay them down like bricks, right? And at the end of the day, you're not you're not tired, you're out of bricks and you need to go recharge and get more bricks, right? And suddenly being tired is like flipped. It's a positive thing, right? You had a good day because it was applied, but yes, I do have less to apply right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if 
now somebody again in that age is fired up um and they're you know about to graduate college in college and they say no actually this sounds more like what i want to do um but they know nothing what would you say is the first step for them of like getting into either startups starting their own um just finding it a lot of people i get asked like how do i even find startups to work for yeah um i i think the I think everything kind of like think about just like going against the grain. Like what is the grain? So to apply to a job, you go to the website for the company and you search for the job applications. That's the grain. How do you go against the grain? Well, like what this kid did when he came and joined us for an internship, which became a full-time offer if he wanted to accept it, right? Is um, he just provided value. And I think in the world, like in, like in life, you can there's like value and then there's things that look like, seem like, or think like value, right? And just avoid those. And so how can you provide value to a company immediately? That's just the number one, right? And and it kind of goes back to the thing earlier, right? Where if you're thinking about opportunity costs, well, what's going to be the best thing? What's going to be the best nest leg up for my career? It's all you're like you're 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 going far from just doing good do, doing good work. Just show up and do good work to anything, and only good will happen. So if you if you find a way to get your foot in the door, find someone on Twitter or go DM them. Um, you could even like if you know look at look at a company and just try to think what do you think their biggest problem is right now. We had a sales and marketing intern before as well. Same thing. She just she emailed us and said like if I was to be a sales and marketing intern, this is what I would do for a go to market approach. It was brilliant. She like thought about a big problem we had. She tried to solve it without even working for us, and then it was like okay. Like, let's do this, right? And so it's not that we're, like, we're anti-internship. It's just that um, it, it's really valuable when someone can kind of go against the grain and 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 kind of force their way in. And I think this works for, this that, that, that advice works for no, no matter who you are, where you are. For us as Brev, for me as the CEO, um, we're working on some partnerships with some cool companies, right? I didn't email and just like, or apply for a partnership or anything. I just tried to provide value, right? And without looking for anything in return. And if you just keep doing that, it's always going to pay off. It's so funny because it, it, it applies beyond just tech or anything. Because um, I, on my social media, I'll get DMs all the time that'll be like, uh, let me work as your video editor. And, and I'm like, okay, um, no, like I'm not going to hire you. I don't have anything. They'll send a portfolio even then. Um, but the ones that I actually look at and the editor that I actually like ended up working with is exactly that. He sent me a strategy. He even gave me like an edited version of my video and just like sent it to me. And I was like, I actually like this guy's work. This is something I would post. And mm -hmm. um, so I think that that extends we actually, everywhere. We just got, uh, someone just emailed us. Uh, we have like the hiring, like I have my email essentially if you want. Anyways, someone emailed us and said, uh, can I work for a few months for free to prove my value? Because he's a junior, who's uh, a junior engineer who's about to who's about to graduate, and so he's like, I, I'm I'm happy to work for free until I graduate to prove my value. That's amazing, and so that actually just it just completely took the risk out of it for me. Where I'm like, yeah, of course we can try this out, and I think you know if you flip the perspective, I remember you know being in college you're freaking out about like, what are you going to do when you graduate? So there's this, I like, you almost like have to land a job right away, but I like what this guy's doing because he's like, I'm just going to lean into this and it, it's going to pay off. And even if it doesn't, the experience that he's going to have is going to get him something that's going to pay off. So just kind of like, fo like let your future self solve your future problems. And yeah. 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 I think a lot of people do, uh, they think that they need something tangible for what they're putting in. Otherwise it wasn't worth it. And I think that, yeah, the experience cannot be understated in literally whatever you're doing. Even if you, you know, try and start a company and then it fails, you have all the lessons from doing that. Yeah. Um, that was actually a big one with Pinot. Like, you know, you kind of worry about like, I think the fear of, of failing in a startup is that you are where you were at the end, but uh, without the time and the energy that you spent, but you're actually where you are at the end with everything you've collected along the way. And that comes with relationships, like you've mentioned, that comes with uh, the skills and the experience. And so um, that's also why like every experience feels that way. Every experience at the end of it, you are there with everything that you've collected. And so the goal, in, if you just think about life as just like a basket and you just put stuff in it, and like, how much can you put in your basket? And imagine, imagine wanting to put some like blueberries in your basket, but you're like, oh, but I can't do that because what's the next, next, next thing that I'm going to put in my basket? Like, that's just weird. Just like one thing at a time. Yeah. Um, I want to not start wrapping up, but I have a, a, a culminating type question, which is it's, it's January, 2024. Um, we're in Chattanooga, Tennessee at the Brickyard. This time next year, whatever you're comfortable sharing, what do you see for Brev? What is your your sort of dream scenario of what you want Brev to look like a year from today? Yeah, I mean, our, our goal is that we make it so easy and so secure that we're just the default way for you to be fine-tuning or training anything. 
um, and and using using the models, deploying them or using them on your computer. Um, that doesn't mean that we have to do all of that. There are amazing companies that we can partner with. But um, yeah, I mean, right now we're putting out a lot of ed like educational content, just showing how to do it. Sometimes it uses our tool, sometimes it doesn't. And um, yeah, so uh, I mean, the the short answer is just more more of everything, right? We, um, I would love to see. I I mean. Uh, yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, then, cause there are a lot of people, you, you mentioned the whole internship thing, um, for people who are really excited about Brev or the concept of Brev, or they just want to follow along or they want to work here one day. Um, where can people not only find you find Brev, wh where should they go? Yeah, I think, um, we're very active on Twitter or X. Um, so my handles natter like ladder, um, our uh, handle Brev dev, we got backstay Carter, um, so definitely just reach out to us there. Um, join our Discord. You can message us. Um, I think, uh, you know, we're, we're in the foot of our website. We say we're intensely non-remote. I have a lot of thoughts on that. I just think if you have two startups that you want to bet on and one of them is remote and one of them is not, put all, go all in on the one that's, that's not remote. It just becomes easier to transmit information, to learn together, move together, get closer together. Um, so, uh, even like a virtual internship is very hard, especially when the premise of an internship is that the person is trying to learn and get gather as much experience. Um, so if someone is in San Francisco uh, and wants to reach out and kind of aligns with everything that we've been saying prior, um, yeah, definitely reach out. Awesome. Um, is there anything else you'd like to either talk about or um, things that we think we missed? Um, no, I think, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really exciting experience. It's a really exciting journey. I think uh, not just being like, I think founder again, goes back to the identity thing. Like it doesn't matter the identity, just like try to build good work, do great work with great people. And honestly, if you can just, if you can intellectually, honestly approach your work, solve great problems with great people, everything else falls into place. And I don't know why it does, but that's, you know, future you finds it. Yeah, no, I, I think that's beautifully said. I'm so excited and uh, just, I also feel like an immense sense of gratitude to be able to take this opportunity and run with it. Hopefully I know that I'm, I'm very, very new and I hope that uh, I'm so also so stoked that I get to share it with uh, my audience and I'm excited to continue doing that. Um, that being said, uh, if you're still watching, please make sure to like, subscribe, comment down below. Um, I don't know, are you interested in building a startup? Do you have any ideas for a startup? Comment those down below. And if you're on any podcast platform, give us five stars. <laughs> Natter, thank you so much for coming yeah, on the show. Of course. And just want to add that too. Um, I'm also very grateful for meeting you many, many years ago for your father getting me into engineering and on this path and and to be to have the opportunity to work with you again. I think this is uh yeah, it's gonna be really fun. Yeah, let's get back to work. It's a Sunday, but we'll be working. Oh yeah. <laughs>